immediate viewers. Uh, CMS first met Rue shortly after he moved from his native southeastern roots to Eugene in 2010 to pursue a doctorate in mycology at the University of Oregon's Institute of Ecology and Evolution. This is the third time Rue has made a presentation for CMS. His first presentation was in 2014 on the diversity and dispersal of tropical forest Xylariaceae. CMS assisted Rue in, with uh, a Freeman Rowe grant for, um, towards his doctoral research. Rue has been a frequent volunteer for the mushroom display set up for the annual Mount Pisgah Arboretum Mushroom Festival. He showcased his artistic talents in the 2016 CMS Fungal Art Exhibit at the Morning Glory Cafe. And he also designed our t-shirt in 2016. Rue serves on CMS's Macro Fungi of Lane County, Oregon Project Steering Committee since 2018. We are certainly happy to have Rue's many talents and extensive knowledge of fungi as part of CMS. And I encourage you all to go on to our website and read uh, a little bit more detailed um, bio of Rue. And with that, I'll just turn it over to Ruth for the evening. Well, hi, everybody. Um, like Tessa said, I'm Ruth Vandegrift. Um, I'm a doctor of mycology from the University of Oregon, um, coming to you live from uh, Portland, Oregon right now, uh, where I've just returned from um, almost three months in Ecuador. I ended up getting stuck in the, the lockdown in uh, Quito in Ecuador and spent seven weeks confined to a, a small house uh, on the outskirts of Quito waiting for the lockdown to clear enough that I could catch a flight back to the U.S. So very exciting. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work that um, has taken me to Ecuador recently. Um, it's called Richer Than Gold, Biodiversity Versus Industrial Mining. Um, and so we're, we'll come back to both of those points, biodiversity and industrial mining throughout the course of this talk. Um, but before I get started, I want to give you a little bit of an update on that macro, uh, macro fungi of Lane County, Oregon project that Cheshire mentioned here. Uh, the macro fungi of macro, why can't I say that today? The macro fungi of Lane County is a, a project that's been spearheaded by a number of people within CMS. Uh, Cheshire has been involved, particularly uh, my PhD advisor, Biddy Roy has done so much to get this together. Uh, we're running the project through iNaturalist. The website's there on the, on the screen. So I, I encourage you to go check it out on iNaturalist. Anybody at all can participate. It's a citizen science initiative. And the idea is to get together a big uh, checklist of all the macro fungi, all the mushrooms, all the large fungi that you find in Lane County, Oregon. Um, we started this on the 5th of March in 2018. Um, and as of yesterday, the 19th of May, uh, we have 6,266 observations of 758 species that have been contributed by 572 different people on iNaturalist, um, of whom 214 are members in the project. Um, so you don't have to be a member of the project to contribute. You can just upload an observation, geotag it within Lane County and it'll be automatically added to the project. Uh, it is now possible, we have enough data to use this iNaturalist project as a rough guide to all of our local fungi. This is really exciting. We're finally, we're over that first hurdle to be able to, to have enough fungi represented that it's useful as an identification tool. Um, we also know from our iNaturalist records that we have dried specimens you know, collected vouchered specimens for more than 300 of the 758 species that we know of to date that exist in Lane County. Uh, and more species are being added to that all the time. Um, yeah, uh, right now we've got about 40 um, of those, speak, uh, those 758 species have been sequenced so far, uh, but we're ready to ship another 100 as soon as this moratorium on sequencing lifts. Uh, there's been a moratorium on sequencing from the National Microflora Project um, as a result of some changes in how they're doing sequencing. Um, and of the 40 that we've sequenced, five of them, so that's 13%, uh, 
could be new species. They're not in gene bank. They're not in the genetic databases. Um, and we haven't been able to pinpoint them in the literature at all. So we've got five species that could be new. And so we're working on that. Uh, and that's a really, you know, so this is part of, uh, part of what's really exciting about this effort is we've got a huge number of people, like I said, 572 contributors uh, so far, uh, and they're, they're sending us all of the really cool things they find here in Lane County. Uh, so more work is needed. Uh, we've also added new names to some of these mysterious, you know, there, there are all these genera that are hard to identify, Mycenas, Rushulas, Anasibis, Agaricus. Um, and so we've added some names to some of these mystery taxa, and we've, we've added a new record for a new species of Agaricus for the entire state of Oregon through this project, Agaricus Porphyrocephalus variation pallidus is a, the first observation in the entire state of Oregon found in Lane County as part of this project. And so that's extremely exciting. And so that's the, that's the update from the microflora of Lane County. Um, I encourage everybody to log into our iNaturalist, uh, take a look at the project. If you use a smartphone and you collect mushrooms, you should 100% be uh, using iNaturalist and uploading them to the project here. Um, and so with that, I'll switch into um, the project, the switch into the, the talk for the day, Richer Than Gold, Biodiversity Versus Industrial Mining. Um, and I just want to say before I, before I get started here, um, we have the YouTube live stream, which is where I imagine most of you are watching this from. Um, and there's a, there's a chat that goes with that YouTube live stream. Um, and so that's where, if you have a question while I'm talking, uh, just pop it into the chat there on the YouTube live stream. I'm gonna be checking in on it regularly. Uh, depending on the question, I might answer it in the course of the talk or um, I, we might wait to the end. Um, I think uh, Cheshire and Sandy are also gonna be monitoring that chat. Um, and if there's something that I missed that's really important, uh, they'll probably interrupt me. So just, we're, we're monitoring that chat. If you have a question, feel free to pop into the chat or talk with other people who are watching the talk about, um, you know, about the talk. It's kind of like you're offline, it's like whispering to your neighbor, uh, except that it doesn't interrupt anybody, which is great. Um, let's see get back over to the talk. So um, this whole project, Richer Than Gold, uh, is more than just me. Uh, this is more than just the sort of fungal biodiversity work. Uh, Richer Than Gold is a project that's cross kingdom. We've got botanists, entomologists, herpetologists, primatologists. It's a huge thing um, that's based around biodiversity work uh, in this cloud forest reserve in Ecuador called Los Cedros. Um, and there's um, profiles on Facebook and Twitter, um, and I think Instagram as well, um, at Richer Than Gold for all of them. If you wanna follow along, that's a great place uh, to follow along. Uh, and so I'm gonna take you over the course of this talk high into the Andes Mountains in, in Northern Ecuador to what we call the cloud forest because it's within the cloud condensation zone uh, where the clouds form. So it's always, it's not just foggy, you're literally up in the clouds. It's an incredible ecosystem, one of the most biodiverse places on earth. Um, but to, to get there, we have to go back and do a little bit of background work. Uh, some of you might recognize this young woman. Um, this, yeah, some of you might recognize this young woman. Um, this is Greta Thunberg. She has been um, absolutely instrumental in the student climate movement. Um, she spawned uh, almost, you might even call it a revolution, um, protests, uh, school strikes, work strikes for climate change. Um, there is a global moment happening right now around the, the state of the earth, climate change. Um, and it's being largely led by youth. Uh, in fact, closer to home, uh, some of you probably know our Children's Trust. This is a group of young people that have sued the US federal government over negligence with regards to climate change. Basically the idea is, uh, the government has not done their part to protect the earth for future generations. Uh, these and future generations represented by these young people. And this, this case is based out of Eugene, Oregon, um, and that was initially heard in the courthouse here in Eugene. 
Um, but of course, it's not just climate that's the big issue. Uh, there are lots of other things going on, um, including pollution, you know, which is related to climate. And we think about pollution, I think at this point, when somebody says pollution, we mostly think about carbon dioxide as that relates to climate change. But it's not just that. There are an incredible number uh, and diversity of uh, toxic and harmful substances that humans release into the environment. You might've heard about this thing called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, uh, but maybe you haven't seen it mapped out. Uh, there are increasing densities of plastics in the ocean off the coast of California in the central Pacific gyre where the, the ocean currents create a, a swirling sort of uh, you know bottom of your bathtub effect and that concentrates all these plastics into one place and it's absolutely huge. And of course it doesn't look like that last picture. Um, it's not big chunks of plastic. These are microplastics, plastics that have been degraded into tiny micron sized particles um, and they end up contaminating the entire food chain. If you eat sea salt, for example, and I, know I love sea salt, it's delicious. Um, and, you know, but if you eat sea salt, at this point, every ounce of sea salt that is produced in the world has plastic in it. It's nothing you can do to get away from that uh, because of humans, because of pollution. So pollution is an issue that is affecting the world on a scale that is similar and related to climate change, but in some ways is also really independent of climate change. And then related to that, there's this idea of biodiversity loss. Um, so Robert Watson has said, high level political attention on the environment has been focused largely on climate change because energy policy is central to economic growth. But biodiversity is just as important for the future of the earth as climate change. Robert Watson is the chairman um, of the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, which is kind of like the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, but with not quite as catchy of a name. Um, and the biodiversity equivalent, right? So Robert Watson is this uh, you know, world-renowned scientist. He's the head of this intergovernmental group working on biodiversity, uh, and he makes a really good point. We focus on climate change because it's important, but also because it's tied to climate, it's tied to energy policy. Oil, coal, gas, these are the things that drive our modern capitalist society. Right? And so that's why we focus on climate change because it's really directly linked to these huge economic drivers. But biodiversity is just as important as climate change. And so that's a point I want you to take home with you. Biodiversity is just as important as climate change. So what do we mean when we talk about biodiversity? Um, this is a great example. Uh, what you're seeing here are orchids, all of which were photographed at Reserva Los Cedros in Ecuador, where I work. This is a place that has more than 300 species of orchid known from this tiny little park. Um, and this is what most people think of when they think of biodiversity. They think of species diversity, all the different types of things that can exist in a particular place. Right? And so that's here at the bottom, species diversity. Can I use my mouse? Oh, I can. Species diversity, number and abundance of species present in different communities. But species diversity is integrally linked with its idea of genetic diversity, the variety of genetic material within a species or population. And that idea is inextricably linked to this idea of functional diversity, which functions are present in a given location or within a given community. And functional diversity, of course, ties directly to ecological diversity, the variety of terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems found in an area, right? And so we have these different scales and different types of diversity that go all the way from the particular genes within an organism up to the particular ecosystems found across the planet, right? We have this huge array of different ways to think about diversity, right? And we want to we want to think about these things because we don't want to put all of our eggs in one basket. If you've reduced the functional diversity, for example, um, to a single nitrogen fixer, 
right? If you're, you've got an ecosystem, you have to have nitrogen in the soil and you've got just one nitrogen fixer and then climate change or pollution or some anthropogenic factor removes that species from the system, no more nitrogen fixation, right? So it's really important to have diversity in these functions. We don't wanna have all of our eggs in one basket because all of these different aspects of diversity are tied to this thing we call ecosystem services. What nature provides for us. Things like food. You know, all of us like to go mushroom hunting in the fall, right? When you go out and you fill a basket with chanterelles, that is a service that the ecosystem provides for you. A service that would not be possible without a great diversity of other things other than the chanterelle. You have to have the host trees for the mycorrhizal fungus. You have to have, you know, this huge array of functioning ecosystem, um, you know, properties to be able to have that service. Um, a great example of an ecosystem service that we all rely on globally is pollination. The pollination of crops globally is estimated to be worth $577 billion annually every year. That's what it would cost if you had to pay somebody to go out with a paintbrush and pollinate each of your crops by hand. Uh, and the ecosystem does it for us for free. It's incredible, right? And that idea, right, that diversity is tied to ecosystem services, which are tied to economy, which are tied to our well-being, right? That brings us back to diversity. So global diversity, right? We all know global diversity increases as we move towards the tropics. And Ecuador, oops, you can see in the square here, um, Ecuador is right there in the darkest, reddest, most biodiverse part of the whole planet, right? Ecuador actually is per square mile, the most biodiverse country in the planet on the planet. It's incredible. It has, this is where I need to find my notes. Hold on just a second. Uh, Zoom cuts off my uh, ability to have my presenter notes while I'm presenting. So I'm having them up on a separate screen. It's a little bit frustrating, bear with me. Um, but so Ecuador has 10% of all the plant species in the world, including more than 3,500 species of orchid. It has 16% of all the bird species on the planet, 16% in a country smaller than the state of Oregon. It has 7% of all the amphibians in the world and 7% of all of the mammals known in the world. This is an incredibly biodiverse country, in part because of the biodiversity of the different ecosystems, and in part because each of those ecosystems is particularly biodiverse. So I work at a place called Reserva Los Cedros, uh, which is up at about 1500 meters of elevation, uh, high in the Andes, um, and so that's what, um, Three, it's like 6,000 feet of elevation, um, right in that cloud condensation zone. It's primary neotropical, neotropical cloud forest. There's nothing quite like it. And it sits right next to this huge globally significant Cotacachi Cayapas ecological reserve, um, which is really inaccessible. And so the, the Reserva Los Cedros, this little protected forest on the edge, uh, provides access to this habitat. And it's really hard to get to. Uh, it's very isolated. You have to take mules uh, for hours to get up to the reserve. And that isolation uh, is part of why it's so well protected, why, why there is this great diversity of birds. And it's only about 60 kilometers north and a tiny bit west of Quito through the mountains. Uh, so you take a bus from Quito uh, for most of it's probably half a day, uh, six hour bus ride through the windy mountain roads, end up in this little town called Chantal, where you wait and you get picked up by a truck, driven to the very end, the literal end of the road, where you meet the mule train coming down from the reserve, bundle all your equipment up onto mules and hike for three hours up into the reserve. Um, and that's part of why there can be this incredible diversity, like this Tucan Barbet, 
um, like these, like these, the, you know, the, we said more than 300 species of orchids known. Um, several species of large cat, like this ocelot, exist at Los Cedros, which is a marker of how healthy the ecosystem is. And that health of the ecosystem is largely due to this difficulty uh, to access the forest. Um, it's why one, it's one of uh, only a handful of places left in the world that have brown-headed spider monkeys, one of the most endangered primates on the planet. Um, and you can really see the effect of that distance as you climb up into the reserve. Uh, as you start climbing, you, you see this you know, beautiful but pastoral landscape. You can see the bananas here in front, the hillsides cleared for pasture land, the village, this is a uh, part of Magdalena, the little, the closest village to Los Cedros uh, down in the valley here. Um, and it's, you know, it's beautiful, but it's, it's colonized. This is a landscape that has been um, affected by the, the people that live there. People have extracted the trees. They have converted the forest to pasture land, um, to agricultural land, and they have reduced the biodiversity severely. But as you go higher, you climb into pristine mountain cloud forest habitat. You can see the, you know, the clouds rolling in and this gorgeous unbroken stretch of habitat. It's incredible. Um, like I said, there are, there are roughly 400 species of orchid um, known from Los Cedros, the 17,000 acre preserve. Uh, there are more than 300 species of tree, of, of standing tree recorded per hectare. Now, a hectare is 100 meters by 100 meters. Um, so it's not a terribly large area. Uh, and for comparison, the state of Oregon, um, where I live, the state of Oregon has 67 species of tree in the entire state. And so 300 species of tree per hectare is incredible diversity. Uh, and that diversity extends to the fungi as well. Um, and so what we're looking at here uh, are just some of the incredible diversity of fungi. Uh, this is a gliocephala, uh, which is um, not, you might expect it to be a cup fungus, like a little, a little uh, ascomycete, but that's not actually true. This is most closely related to marasmius. This is a gillless marasmius on a leaf. Uh, Higrosibi, uh, beautiful. This is probably an undescribed Higrosibi actually. Uh, Xylobotrium, which was recently given its own class level designation, the Xylobotriomycetes. Um, and then this gorgeous green mycena here. Um, and these are all photographs from my colleague, Danny Newman, who's done some work with us up at Los Cedros and is a phenomenal photographer of fungi. Um, and of course, what first brought me to Los Cedros um, was related to this orchid diversity we keep bringing up, these hundreds of species of, of, uh, of orchids. Um, there's a genus called Dracula. In, in the world, there's about 150 species of Dracula, uh, including Dracula vampira. Um, but you'll notice for all of these, they have this central petal, this labellum, that has this kind of gilled mushroom-like appearance. Um, and in fact, here you can see the labellum of a Dracula morlii, um, which looks like a gilled mushroom. And then here are mushrooms collected from within a handful of meters around that flower um, that are the mimic. And so for a long time, people thought, oh, this is a mushroom mimic. Uh, and it turns out uh, it is a mushroom mimic. Uh, this is very, very similar um, and is in fact pollinated by the same flies that visit these mushrooms. And so my colleague Tobias Policha did his dissertation in this, um, in the, the mimicry system for pollination for these orchids. Um, and that's the first thing that brought me was to help with that project. Um, and speaking of this insane diversity, there are there are 800 species of flies uh, that are associated with the pollination of these orchids and uh, with these mushrooms that co-occur with the orchids that were described from this work. Um, so 800 uh, of which more than 80 are new species to science. Um, so just to give you a taste of that incredible diversity. Um, and of course, I wasn't really interested in the orchids. Um, I came down to work with the fungi. Uh, and so in the early years, Bryn Dentinger, um, who was then, who was a postdoc at the time and later became the um, curator of fungi at Kew Gardens and is now at Utah, um, was leading these mushroom surveys where they were collecting all the different fungi um, 
from around to see if they could figure out what was the, the host for these flies. Um, and then Tommy Jenkinson was involved in that early work as well. Uh, he switched and has been working on chytrids recently. Highly recommend checking out his work. He does some great work with chytrids. And so I came down to help with these mushroom surveys. Uh, and this work, if you're interested in it, this work has been published in New Phytologist. Um, I can put a citation at the end of the talk in the chat log if you'd like. Um, but we made the cover, as you'll see here. Uh, it's my, my colleague Tobias's uh, photograph here. Uh, the paper was called Disentangling Visual and Olfactory Signals in Mushroom Mimicking Dracula Orchids Using Realistic Three-Dimensional Printed Flowers. It's a really fascinating study. Um, there's actually a new study that just came out last year called Dracula Orchids Exploit Guilds of Fungus Visiting Flies, New Perspectives on a Mushroom Mimic. Also totally worth checking out. Uh, but of course, I'm not really interested in the guild mushrooms. Uh, I went down for the Xyleria, that's kind of my thing, right? Um, and so in the course of these mushroom surveys, they found a large number of Xylarias, uh, and they mostly ignored them in those early years because they clearly weren't the mimic for those orchids, right? Um, so Xyleria hypoxylon, this is our most common Xyleria in Oregon. Uh, very iconic with this, these highly branched tips, this white, it's called candle snuff fungus or carbon antlers for the shape. Uh, in Ecuador, the variety of Xylarias is just incredible. In Oregon, we have five species um, that, are, that are known. Um, one is common, one is really rare, uh, one has not been formally described yet, but has been observed. Uh, one has been observed once and is undescribed. Uh, and the other is a rumor and it hasn't really been confirmed yet. So, you know, Oregon, not much in the way of Silaria diversity. Ecuador, incredible Silaria diversity. Is, I'm in heaven when I go there. Um, so this is Silaria schweinitzii, big, they're like your big thumb uh, sticking up. Uh, Xylaria tuberoides, uh, golf ball sized spheres of Xylaria. Uh, Xylaria scruposa with its scrupose surface, beautiful fungus. Um, and Xylaria are really important ecologically. They are hands down the most common fungus decaying wood in tropical systems, period. That makes them globally significant players in the carbon cycle. The reason we have a functioning carbon cycle that gives us, you know, kind of all of the things that it gives us, photosynthesis, the, the breath of the earth. Um, you could really say that like Xylaria are why we have a functioning carbon cycle on a, from a global perspective. But they're also really important because they're often invisible symbionts of plants, what we call endophytes endo for inside, fight for plant. And so every leaf you see in this picture and pretty much anywhere in the world uh, is chock full of endophytes, dozens or hundreds of species of fungi living asymptomatically, no harm to the plant as symbionts within the leaves. And almost every single leaf you see will have a xylaria as an endophyte. They're one of the most common and ubiquitous endophytes anywhere in the world. Um, which is, you know, there's a huge question, why should that be? Uh, and so that's what I set out to do, my dissertation. Why is this common wood decomposer also common endophyte? Um, and, you know, spoilers if you've already seen uh, one of my other talks, but, you know, it's, I think it's because endophytism can be a, a means of dispersal. It's how the fungi get around. Uh, and so this is, the this is the conceptual model. Xylaria fruit on wood, and produce spores. And sometimes they fruit on some other things, but mostly wood. Some of those spores get up into the canopy and they cause these asymptomatic infections in the leaves, becoming endophytes. There's this potential for leaf to leaf dispersal to amplify the amount in the canopy. We've never observed it with Xylaria, but it has been observed in some other endophytes. Really though, the next interesting thing is when those leaves are shed, they fall back to the forest floor where the fungi can escape the leaf and grow back into wood and the cycle can continue. And of course, there's also direct dispersal from this, you know, the spores from the fruiting bodies on the wood back you know, over to new wood. Uh, that's probably the most likely path of dispersal for these fungi most of the time with this endophyte loop being a bet hedging strategy. Uh, and so this is our study site in Ecuador. Um, 
This is the actual site where we did the work, primary neotropical forest. Um, it's because it rains so much uh, at Los Cedros here, it rains about four meters or 12 feet every year. For comparison, uh, Eugene, I think it's about three feet a year. So just imagine what 12 feet of rain a year would be like. Um, and that's the reason that it looks so scrubby because there's frequent floods that come through. Uh, this is the site, half a hectare, 120 points. Uh, each little point, the size of the opening of the circle uh, relates to how open the canopy was above. You can see there'd been a tree fall right here that opened the canopy up a little bit and a tree fall here. The arrows point downhill and the length of the arrow is how steep the slope was. In general, the site's pretty flat, except for a couple of steep spots near the stream. And there's this tiny little stream, less than a meter wide, you could just step right over it, uh, that runs through the site. There's little streams everywhere in this area. Uh, this is one of the flattest spots in all of Los Cedros, actually. Um, and so here we are collecting Xylarias. Uh, this is my colleague, Dan Thomas, there's me. Um, and this is our botanist, Danilo Simba, uh, who ducked every time we pointed a camera at him. Um, and so the idea is if you collect Xylarias, different species at different points on this grid, and you collect the same species as endophytes at various points on the grid, you should be able to put those distributions together and find out if they're linked in space. And man, we found Xylarias, all kinds of crazy Xylarias. Here's Xylaria fissilis, Xylaria globosa, Xylaria telfarii, Xylaria ianthovelutina, is one of my favorite names for Xylaria. Um, Xylaria atrospherica, this fissilis again, uh, Schweinitzii, which we saw earlier, and Telfarii in its young anamorphic state. Um, but we also collected leaves. We collected two leaves from the closest tree for each point, both large and small, whatever was nearby. Um, and from each of those leaves, we did something kind of crazy. In the middle of the jungle, we set up a culture facility where we could grow fungi grow the endophytes from inside those leaves in sterile, isolated conditions um, in this little tiny cabin in the middle of the jungle. So you can see here's a pressure cooker. This was our autoclave. Uh, this is our one square foot laminar flow hood for sterile culture work, our microscope, and here's our culture library. All told, we ended up with more than 1500 fungal cultures as part of this project, which wouldn't have been possible without the dedicated aid of an undergraduate, Matthew Davis. Uh, pictured here swinging on a vine like Tarzan. Um, and we cultured Xylarias. This is what a Xylaria endophyte looks like in culture. They make these beautiful concentric rings. Um, it's gorgeous. And then we correlated uh, where each of the fungi were as endophytes and as fruiting bodies across the site with all of these environmental variables we collected. Um, and in the end, uh, what we found was that indeed there is a linkage between the endophytic life stage and the fruiting bodies. They're linked in space, which is evidence for this dispersal linkage that we were theorizing. We also found that the fruiting bodies were constrained by the environment. You found of the species that occur as both endophytes and uh, stromata, you find the ones in the stromatal life stage restricted by the stream. Uh, they're more likely to occur closer to the stream than you expect by chance. The endophytes, however, no environmental restrictions. So they're released, uh, which is something you'd expect from this dispersal strategy. We also found that the endophytes were a subset of the fruiting bodies, uh, which means that not all xylarias have the ability to form an endophytic phase. Um, the ones that do are likely doing it for a reason. Um, and then the last thing we investigated, all of these linkages we found that support this hypothesis, they're all in this, the A to B link. Uh, we wanted to examine this B through C linkage, um, the dispersal back down to wood. So we took some leaves, just bleached the outside and put them down on popsicle sticks. Uh, and so what you're seeing here is a little piece of a popsicle stick, which has fungus that has been grown from the endophytic stage of a leaf into that popsicle stick and then incubate it. And then after several weeks, you see here the fruiting body of a Xylaria forming from this section of a popsicle stick. So indeed, you can have dispersal back to wood 
by way of the leaf itself. Um, and so this is the first and strongest evidence uh, for what we call the foraging ascomycete hypothesis. So that was my dissertation. It's been published in the journal Biotropical, uh, Biotropica, I don't know, it's hard to say, um, the spatial ecology of the fungal genus Silaria in a tropical cloud forest uh, with co-first authorship with my colleague, Daniel Thomas. Um, but that was all really cool. But one of the things we didn't really get to, uh, to publish that I think is just as interesting is the Xyleria diversity. So I've continued uh, from there to work with the diversity of Xyleria at those sites. And so this is a Xyleria that is huge, nine inches tall, brick red, uh, really distinctive morphology, not uncommon. We've collected it almost every year that we've been there. And yet, this Silaria is undescribed. We're working up right now a, a paper describing this and several other species. Um, super cool uh, and likely uh, restricted endemic to the region where Los Cedros is. Uh, there's incredible other diversity. We ended up in that half hectare plot, we found 36 species excuse me, we found 36 species of Xyleria in that half hectare plot, um, right? Remember, the state of Oregon has five. Uh, so this is incredible. So this is Xyleria multiplex in its young stage. Um, this is another really interesting one. Um, this is grown only on the combs of bamboo, a very specific substrate uh, and one that is uncommon for Xylarias. This also represents an undescribed taxon. This is a really fascinating one, Xyleria telfarii, large Xylarias, and they produce this gelatinous interior, which is theorized to be a moisture retention mechanism to help with spore release. Xyleria globosa, the rubied Xyleria, we call them, is unmistakable because of these red exudates that the stromata form in the young stage. One of my personal favorites, Silaria kegeliana, which demonstrates the persistent ectostromatic coating, which some Silarias have. So you can see here in the section one uh, where the parathesia are present. Uh, and then you can see this white line with a black line in the interior, uh, marking the ecto and the entostromatic tissues. Uh, some Silarias are really tiny and are basically nothing more than just naked parathesia on a stalk. So this is Xyleria tucumanensis, uh, which is a first record for all of Ecuador um, and also the farthest north record of this relatively recently described fungus anywhere in the world. Uh, and it's absolutely beautiful. Um, and this, this photograph was actually the cover of um, the journal Biotropica when we published that paper. Uh, this is another undescribed taxon that we've discovered uh, just in our most recent trip last year to Los Cedros. Um, this is the smallest Silaria uh, recorded ever. Uh, this entire fruiting body, uh, top to bottom, is about a millimeter. Uh, just absolutely incredibly small. Um, and so I'm working to describe this diversity um, slowly, uh, but I would like to publish a book, Xylarias of the Cloud Forest of Ecuador. Um, and so I've been working towards illustrating these. Uh, this is Xylaria affinis camosa um, in the, the sense of Thomas Lasso. Um, Xylaria fissilis is one of the most common Xylaria at Los Cedros. You can always tell fissilis because it has these horizontal constrictions in the stromata from where the parathesia develop. Um, Xylaria apiculata, which has these vertical zebra stripes due to the, the rupturing of the ectostromatic coating, this white coating on the surface, as the parathesia swell from underneath. Um, Xyleria schweinitzii, which we've seen already. Xyleria globosa, and of course, in a black and white drawing, the exudates can't be red. Um, and you'll notice on all of these, uh, we illustrate the spore characteristics. Uh, this clear line in the spore is a really important identifying character for Xyleria that wasn't really recognized until the 60s. Um, okay, so that's a good moment. So there's this incredible Xyleria diversity, uh, which is 
kind of a reflection of the general, the incredible diversity of Los Hedros. And that diversity is under threat. And typically um, that threat has been kind of a slow burn. Um, and so this is the cycle that that threat usually takes. And for some reason, none of my animations are functioning today. I wanna to apologize for that. Uh, something about this particular computer perhaps, uh, or something about running it through Zoom, I don't know. But usually what happens is um, somebody builds a road. And so this is where we start. We start with this road. Somebody builds a road because you know you need roads, right? Like, uh, like Douglas Adams says, you have to have bypasses. Um, and so we, somebody builds a road uh, because you wanna get somewhere. Uh, and it's a lot faster to get somewhere with a road than without one. Um, and that road almost invariably uh, enters into some primary forest in, in Ecuador. Um, you know, there's, if you build a new road, you're coming through uncolonized land. And that impacts ecosystems. And the first impact that is felt really is that once the road provides access, it becomes absolutely feasible for people to make a living extracting lumber. Um, and so it looks to take just a minute to consider that each of these mules is carrying four to six, 12 foot lengths of like four by four by eights, basically of wet milled rainforest timber. Um, so each, each mule here is carrying something like eight or 900 pounds of timber. Uh, it's absurd. These mules work so hard. Um, and this is, this is a hard way to make a living, but it, it, it works. Uh, and it's in a, in a economically depressed part of the world. Um, for many people, this is their only option. When a new road goes in, it opens up new economic opportunities for people who have no other options. And so the timber starts coming out. And once enough timbers come out, it starts making a lot of sense to clear that land for pasture. Cattle is the biggest business in all of Ecuador. There are more cows in Ecuador than there are people. And so once the, once the cattle comes in, well, there's a need for better and more roads to get the meat and the dairy to market. And if you build more roads, it opens the forest for exploitation, which leads to more clearing for cattle. And it's just this long cycle. And so Los Cedros has, since the mid nineties, when it was founded, uh, been fighting this cycle, been you know, closing down new pathways that get opened into the reserve, uh, prosecuting people who log timber illegally from within the reserve, uh, you know, evicting squatters who come in and try to create cast, uh, cattle pastures within the bounds of the reserve. It's hard work and it requires constant vigilance. But that cycle has been disrupted recently. There's a new threat to Reserva Los Cedros. The specter of large scale mineral extraction has come to Ecuador in a big way. Um, and so this is an open pit gold mine, um, which is the kind of mining that is being proposed for uh, not just the area around Los Cedros, but for within the bounds of the reserve itself. Um, reserve Los Cedros, this protected forest where I have worked for almost a decade, uh, has been granted by the government in mining concessions to a Canadian mining company called Cornerstone Capital Resources. So in response to this, um, myself here and Biddy uh, from, you know, from University of Oregon, the number of our colleagues, Tobias, who did the ORCID work, Dan, who worked on the Zylaria project, uh, a bunch of colleagues from Ecuador, Martin Zaria, uh, Lorena Endara, uh, Morley, like, you know, all these people who care about um, the effect that this kind of mining could have on these ecosystems. We came together and we wrote this paper on how these new mining concessions could decrease biodiversity and ecosystem services in Ecuador. Uh, and in fact, the, the original title of the paper, paper was not could severely decrease, it was will severely decrease. Um, and you know, we had to pull that back to be, to meet the kind of 
I don't know, the editor wanted us to pull it back. But um, I, I think if you read the paper, it's, it's not unclear what will happen. So this paper is published open access. It's freely available. Um, I highly encourage you, if you're interested in these issues, grab that paper and read it. Um, and part of what we did is we put together um, incredible species lists, really bitty, um, put together these species lists for Los Cedros and for other places, documenting the number of endangered species. Um, and you, know, you can see that you know, the, the losses could be incredible. Um, there right now are known to be um, more than 148 endangered species at Los Cedros itself. Um, and this is a site they're proposing for mining. Um, and so this is what happened. This is Ecuador. This is a map of Ecuador, just the land area. Um, and before all this happened in July of 2017, uh, this was the land area that was available to mining um, for exploration and for exploitation. Uh, you know, not too much is more in the South. There's a couple of big old, like old Spanish gold mines from colonial days in the South that have been trouble in a lot of ways. Uh, that's a whole different story. But, you know, for the most part, not too much. Uh, in August of 2017, this happened. A 300% increase in the amount of land available to mining in Ecuador, all across the country. Uh, and to give you an idea of what this kind of mining looks like, uh, this is a similar habitat uh, mountains in Brazil, tropical rainforest. Uh, this is an iron mine. Um, and here, this square you can see, this is the town of Carajas, where everybody who works in the mine or associated with the mine lives. 6,000 people live in this town. They have nightclubs, they have hospitals, uh, you know, they have everything that a, a town of 6,000 would have. And it is a town that can be dwarfed by the pit of the mine here. And you see these red areas um, up here in particular, these are the tailing ponds. Uh, this is where when you, you pull all this ore out of the ground, you process it with water. And that water has to go somewhere. It goes into these things they call tailing ponds. Um, you know, and just to give you an idea of the scale of this kind of mine, this is that gold mine, it's in Australia. Um, the pit of this mine is more than a kilometer deep. And these vehicles you can see here in the bottom, these are the size of 18 wheel semi trucks, right? These are not gentle operations. You might've heard uh, last year about uh, this disaster where a tailings pond in Minas Gerais in Brazil burst, uh, pushing millions of cubic meters of toxic sludge uh, into the river uh, and killing hundreds of people in a single go, not to mention the number of people that are uh, sick and dying from the toxicity that was added to the river where they get their drinking water, uh, where the, you know, the livelihoods that have been lost from the fishing that's no longer available. Uh, and you might say, well, how does this kind of disaster happen? Uh, well, these tailings ponds are, are you know, capped with a dam uh, but the mining company doesn't want to spend any more money than they have to. And so you can see these horizontal striations in the dam. And what happens is they, they use compacted mud to build the dam. And they, they start out building it as small as they can manage. Um, so that if the mine is not productive, they haven't built more infrastructure than they need it. And then if the mine continues to be productive and they have to put more liquid in this tailings pond, well, they just add another layer on top of it. And then if the mine keeps being productive and the level goes up, they just add another layer on top of it and so on. These dams are never engineered to hold back the amount of water that is behind them. Now imagine a dam like this constructed haphazardly in a place like Los Cedros, where it rains 12 meters a year, and where the return rate for magnitude seven earthquakes is about once a decade. These, there are severe earthquakes regularly in this part of the world. Um, Mining engineering experts have said that this part of the world, where Los Cedros is, what they, they call the Choco bioregion, 
uh, in the Andes, uh, there is, it is impossible to have a safe, sustainable mine in this part of the world because of the biodiversity threats and the threat of uh, contamination of water systems downstream, right? Um, and so to add kind of, you know, to add to this, the, the, this issue of incredible increases in mining concessions in a short period of time, uh, here's those mining concessions in orange overlapped with Ecuador's system of Bosque Protectores, the protected forests. Um, and you'll notice everything in red is a protected forest that is now under threat of mining. Uh, and the, the part that's not really shown on the map is that before this mining expansion in 2017, the number of Bosque Protectores that had mining concessions over them was zero. So this is new. And you can see here, this little red dot in the circle, uh, this is Reserva Los Cedros, um, now under mining concession to a Canadian mining company. Um, and the mining companies will tell you the, well, the process of exploration is not really, uh, you know, all that difficult, all, you know, all that hard, um, or all that hard on the landscape. Uh, but what they don't tell you is that the exploration causes issues. To, to explore, they have to make these deep cuts so they can see the mineral profile. So this is mining exploration from the next valley over in Hunin, which is in the same ecosystem. Um, and you can see they're, you know, they're examining the, the mineral profile of the soil, looking for promising minerals. Uh, and to do that, they have to bring in really heavy equipment, which means they have to build roads. And we know what happens when you build roads in these systems, it opens it up for exploitation. So even if a mine is not opened because they didn't find promising mineral signatures, this is still really, really bad for these protected forests. Uh, the other thing that's really problematic here, I think I can, yeah. The other thing that's a real issue here is the way that this interacts with the water cycle in Ecuador. We've been calling these cloud forests for a reason. This is the zone where clouds condense. And you'll notice all of the trees in this zone are just absolutely covered in epiphytes. There are bromeliads, ferns, mosses, orchids, just draped all over everything. And that is because as the warm air from the ocean is pushed over the mountains, it climbs up the mountains and it cools and the water in the air condenses into clouds. The vegetation actually serves as a sieve to pool the water out of the clouds. Um, and it, it actually ends up being that something like 60% of the moisture that reaches the ground in these cloud forests doesn't fall as rain. It's sieved from the clouds themselves by the vegetation. If you clear this vegetation, you reduce the amount of water reaching the ground by more than half in many cases. This cloud forest zone is the source of Ecuador's drinking water. Almost universally, millions of people rely on these forests to generate clean water for drinking. And in fact, the people that live in these areas, they don't treat the water at all. They just drink it straight from the stream because it's so pure. And this cloud forest zone is disproportionately impacted by these new mining concessions. So what you can see here, uh, everything in green is this Andean cloud forest, this Andean forest that's remaining. And everything in this reddish color is everything that's under concession. And of course, this area, this zone has been really highly in, impacted by previous colonization. And you can see everything in this mustard color has already been cleared. On the Western slope of the Andes, we have hardly any of this forest left. And the majority of what is left has been granted in mining concessions. The other thing that makes this mining expansion extremely tragic is the way it's impacting indigenous people. So this is a warrior from the Shuar people down in the Amazon. The Shuar people have their ancestral territories right here. They have seen 70% of their lands included in mining concession without any kind of consultation or consent from the tribe, uh, which goes against international treaties, UN regulations, and Ecuador's own policies and regulations. 
Um, closer to where I work in the north, the Awa people uh, have seen also 70% of their lands included in mining concessions. Now, last year, there was a huge march on Quito. Uh, the Confederation of Amazonian Tribes organized a march on the capital city in protest of this. And they ended up getting uh, in the Awa lands and in the Shuar lands, a certain amount of these concessions revoked, pulled back. But there's never been an official announcement, an official apology, and the mining companies involved are still working in these areas trying to convert people to their point of view. This propaganda is still ongoing. So how do you respond to something like this? It's just too, it's too much, it's too big uh, to really think about this huge geopolitical economic thing. Uh, and so, you know, I've done really the only thing I know how to do in response. Uh, and I have responded with science. Um, so we organized this richer than gold expedition uh, funded by National Geographic and the American Orchid Society. Here's a selection of the crew. Um, and it was a huge, it was a huge collaboration. Researchers from all over the United States, uh, a, lot of, a lot of them based in Oregon, but many in New York as well. Uh, and researchers from all over Ecuador. Um, and yeah, and so we took everybody that we could get for this cross kingdom biodiversity survey up to the headwaters of the Los Cedros River, um, high into the unexplored part of Reserva Los Cedros to document the biodiversity that would be lost if a mine is opened. And of course, to get to this kind of pristine, undisturbed, unexplored habitat um, requires some legwork. Uh, and so this is, this is the actual access trail to our base camp is my colleague Dan Thomas, literally knee deep in mud. Uh, this, this is the most difficult field work I have ever done. And I think any, everybody on the trip agreed that it was the most difficult field work that anybody had ever done. Uh, and so here, just to give you an idea, even the mules who are these you know, steadfast, short-footed creatures, uh, even the mules didn't really like this trail. Um, and so here you can see Martine, uh, who's one of the um, kind of, uh, it's like a, like a field guide who works at Los Cedros, um, who's running the mules back and forth. He's a competitive long distance runner. Um, he didn't mind the trail so much as the mules did, but even the mules didn't like it. And we built a base camp um, where we could house almost 20 researchers comfortably for a month uh, in this high elevation, area on the, on the banks of the headwaters of the Los Cedros River. Um, we used a tree fall that we milled into some boards to create the camp. We dug a latrine. I'm not gonna show you the pit of the latrine. This is the surface of the latrine. We even had some time for some bird watching in the meantime. Um, and this is the camp once it was finished. There are um, six, eight, or six four person tents and plus a couple of two person tents. Um, there's a kitchen. Uh, Footpaths, we had to dig drainage around the whole thing. We had to terrace the mud to have a flat place to be able to put our tents. Uh, it was incredible. This is Martine. We had to get this top line to string the plastic over everything to keep everything dry. Because remember, it rains 12 meters a year here. Um, and actually it rains 12 meters a year at the research station. Up, we're about a thousand meters above the research station here. And it definitely rained more. We were there for just over a month and it rained an entire meter in the course of that month. And so this is Martin, uh, you know, 10 meters up a tree uh, that he climbed up on the epiphytes to be able to string this top line. Uh, not safe, kids, don't try this at home. Uh, the kitchen, even the kitchen was an adventure. You can see our pressure cooker so we could make beans, uh, rice. We had, you know, these little propane pots and, and wood stove and uh, little propane stoves to be able to cook. Um, you can see all the laundry laid out because everything's wet all the time. Uh, this is my tent. Um, you know, the just you, just the constant battle with the mud and the water. Uh, but the view, you know, the view is worth it, I think, just this incredible forest. Um, and so we had, you know, groups of researchers uh, of all stripes, entomologists, herpetologists, um, mycologists, botanists. Uh, and so this is uh, one of the sketchbook pages from the entomology assistant. Uh, these are the entomologists, uh, Patty Kaishan, who actually is working with the bugs so that she can catalog labulolabinealian fungi, which are parasites of bugs, um, using a black light to attract insects in the night. Uh, kind of looks like a disco. 
Uh, we also used uh, malaise traps, which is a passive netting to capture bugs. Um, Sarah was uh, one of the uh, volunteers on the botany crew who is absolutely essential to the project. Elisa Levy is the research coordinator for Los Cedros and one of our primary Ecuadorian counterparts. She's a entomologist that works on lepidopteran, um, lepidopteran insects, that's uh, butterflies and moths, uh, mostly butterflies. Um, and this is the kitchen. You can see the state of the mud. Um, but it wasn't all, you know, it wasn't all hard work. We had some chance to relax. Uh, this is a, a tropical fruit cocktail constructed with a, the machete in the background is how we slice the fruit. Uh, this is Sarah's reward for uh, terracing the kitchen after uh, she probably moved a literal ton of mud that day. So she deserved that drink. Uh, this is the mycological laboratory. So we spent a month doing mycology in this. Uh, and you can see the pelican case in the bucket. We had to keep things dry. Um, all of our specimens uh, were packed with silica gel uh, after dehydrating. You can see our dehydrator uh, here. We had a small gas generator to provide some electricity. Actually, the generator is here under this tarp. Um, so we dehydrate things with this little low energy dehydrator, and then they get packed with silica gel into these snap lock Tupperwares to stay dry. This five gallon bucket here is full of silica gel. Uh, it's a powerful desiccant. It turns out silica gel is actually really difficult to get in Ecuador. Uh, and so we ended up between the mycology crew and the botany crew, we ended up bringing more than 200 pounds of silica gel to Ecuador with us. And we carefully documented all of the fungi that we could find. And we ended up collecting more than 300 specimens in the course of this trip last year. Um, what you see here is a hypocreolian fungus on a bamboo leaf under the camera. Um, and here, this is Ascopoliparus uh, on bamboo. That's uh, one of the really interesting, fascinating fungus. It's a hypocreolian, a cordyceps relative, grows on a scale insect, uses the scale insect, um, just eats the scale insect entirely, except for its mouth, which it uses as a straw to suck juice out of the bamboo. Uh, and then uh, and then grows to hundreds of times the insect that initially infected. Uh, other cordyceps relatives really shown on this trip. Uh, this is a spider. This is about nine inches long. Uh, there's a trapdoor spider in its webbing here, and the fungus crawled out of the trapdoor and then fruits out the top. So we had to dig this out. Uh, here's another uh, spider. This is the Cordyceps nidus group, these orange spider-associated cordyceps. And so here you can see the body of the spider. The body of the spider is about three inches, or probably two inches long from, from stem to stern here. And the whole fungus from the spider to the tip of the fruiting body over here is roughly nine inches long. The giant cordyceps here. Uh, here's another one. This is a gibberella, a cordyceps anamorph, a asexual form on a spider. Uh, what's interesting about this one is it was collected by our botany tree climbing crew 30 meters off the ground. So that's some incredible spore spreading potential from up there. Um, Cordyceps tacumantana on the pupa of moths was relatively common. Um, this is a really fascinating one. Uh, here what we have is mycomalus and neomunchia, which are two of these bamboo-associated cordycepitaceous fungi. Um, this one is parathecial, uh, and you can see the parathecial layer here. Uh, and this one is asexual. These little white nodules are bundles of asexual spores called pycnidia. Um, and what's really fascinating is for about 100 years, uh, these rarely collected fungi have been, it's been speculated, well, maybe this is the anamorph to that and what you can't really tell in this picture is that this comb of bamboo is the same comb of bamboo as this one. And so we have, for the first time, solved a hundred year old taxonomy mystery in that Mycomalus and Neomunchia are two different forms of the same taxon. And we've got the DNA and the, the habitat information and the collection really to prove it, including um, intermediate forms between the two. So that's really, we solved a hundred year old taxonomic mystery. Uh, something that could never have happened if a mine was opened on this site. And because we also found all kinds of other interesting ascomycetes. This, the substrate here is the thorn of a tree fern. And this is a Holoshialian discomycete. Absolutely beautiful, far less than a millimeter across, very tiny. 
Uh, there's lots of basidiomycete mushrooms. This is a favalacea, uh, which is, um, looks like it should be a polypore, but it's really more closely related to mycena. Crepidotus, you might recognize. We have some crepidotus here in Oregon. Um, but really Merasmius is where it's shown with these collections. We ended up with something like 60 species of Merasmius from these collections, an enormous diversity. Uh, there's our lab bench again. Um, we also, the orchids were an incredible, uh, an incredible part of this expedition. Uh, the, this is the part of the botany crew. Tobias was leading the botany crew. Martin, who works at Los Cedros, um, helped with Marco and Chieta, two Ecuadorian orchidologists. They did an expedition within an expedition and went up to the high elevation and collected more than 70 species of orchid in a single trip, um, including you know, just some incredible things. Uh, including a, a new record of a new species of Dracula for Los Cedros. Uh, this is the orchid laboratory. It was in one of the tents. Um, you can see uh, Tobias's photographic setup here, getting ready to photograph these tiny, tiny orchids. Um, and then we used what was called a modified gentry plot to make sure the plant data and the fungus data were able to be correlated. And so this is the center of that plot. And you can see this hammock is not actually for relaxing. The hammock is to put your gear in so it doesn't end up in mud. And this is Tobias, the head of the botany crew. Uh, this is what it's like to work in these conditions. You're wet, but you're happy. We ended up with more than 600 botany specimens, which are now uh, with uh, Walter Palacios in Ecuador. Um, and more than 350 fungal collections, which have been duplicated. The primary collections have been deposited at the National Herbarium in Quito, and the splits are here in Oregon, though where we're working on them at the University of Oregon now. Uh, we even had a chance to do some uh, outreach. This is Tobias on national television. Um, and right as we were um, finishing our field work, the first uh, case where this case where Cornerstone um, Cornerstone's claim to concessions at Los Cedros uh, went to court um, while we were there. So this is a protest in Ibarra where the courthouse is over the concessions at Los Cedros. Um, and we ended up um, being lucky enough to be involved in this a little bit. Um, and the, that court case is still ongoing. It's moved up to the Constitutional Court of Ecuador, the highest court in Ecuador. And we just got word literally today uh, that the Constitutional Court will hear the case, which is really good news. Um, the, the mining company has um, basically said that they won't listen to any court but the Constitutional Court. Um, and so with that, I should, I should thank everybody, uh, particularly National Geographic, for funding that last round of field work um, and all of, you know, Cascade Mycological Society and all the other local mycological societies that helped fund my dissertation. Um, I should thank the mules uh, who this wouldn't have been possible without. Um, and everybody who has worked at Los Cedros, past and present, uh, Jose de Cou, who has tirelessly defended this reserve from the beginning, um, Fausto Lomas is one of the other field hands, uh, the you know, paratexonomists and um, guides at Los Cedros, my advisor, Biddy, uh, Bryn, who helped start these mushroom surveys, um, everybody from this year's field work um, at Los Cedros, the Richard and Gold expedition, including Rosa Batayos, who's the uh, curator of fungi at the National Herbarium in Quito, uh, my partner James, who uh, just helped so much coming out on this trip, uh, you know, the, the orchidologists, the botany crew, including Tobias and Dan and Aaron, uh, the entomology crew, uh, Patty, uh, Danny, the photographer, uh, everybody did so much. But in particular, I have to thank the film crew, um, Dylan Starwalt, uh, Clay Cruz, Antoniela Carrasca, Solange Yepes. Uh, it's a collaboration between uh, American and Ecuadorian filmmakers uh, who came to document this expedition and are creating a film about this mining expansion in Ecuador. And so I'd like to, I'd like to end by uh, showing you the trailer for, um, for our film, um, if you're interested. I mean, you feel free to sign out if you're not interested, but. Um.
Jerry. Eh, Borna, los 10. 